It's a pleasure to welcome you all to my keynote on pushing the boundaries of sickle with hipsicle. My name is Axel Alpay. I work for Heidelberg University and I lead the hipsicle implementation of the sickle standard. Let's first discuss how sickle um, is commonly interpreted and where it originally came from. Sickle really started its life as a higher level model for OpenCL. And that means that originally in sickle there was a one-to-one -one mapping from sickle objects to OpenCL objects. So if you had a sickle queue, that would map to an OpenCL command queue. If you had a sickle device, that would map to an OpenCL device. If you had a sickle platform, that would map to an OpenCL platform, and so on and so forth. Similarly, the sickle task graph that um, uh, sickle uses to organize the execution of its kernels and other operations can mostly be offloaded to OpenCL's handling of out-of-order queues and OpenCL dependencies. As far as compilation is concerned, there's an, a host compilation, there would be a host compilation pass which would compile kernels as regular C++ as fallback, but that was generally not intended for performance. And then there's going to be an additional device compiler pass with a specific sickle compiler to extract kernels and generate uh, some intermediate representation like spear or spear v. And uh, when a kernel is executed, this intermediate representation would then be passed into the OpenCL, OpenCL runtime for execution. Now, in SQL 2020, we have now introduced other backends apart from OpenCL. And, uh, but still, many implementations kind of have this or, or original design in their DNA, especially if they also support OpenCL as a backend. But that's not really the case for Hipsicle, because Hipsicle has always been independent from those traditional SQL interpretations, because it, it never even had an OpenCL backend. So Hipsicle has always been about exploring other interpretations of SQL. And this is the subject of this talk. So let's dive into Hipsicle. Hipsicle is a multi-backend SQL implementation. We currently have four backends. We have a CUDA backend for NVIDIA GPUs, a Rockham backend for AMD GPUs, an OpenMP backend for CPUs, as well as a level zero backend for Intel GPUs. Hipsicle is built on the idea of aggregating multiple tool chains under a common roof. So you can use Hipsicle, but underneath use an OpenMP tool chain, a Clang CUDA tool chain, a Clang HIP tool chain, a Clang SQL tool chain, or even NVIDIA's NVC++ compiler. Hipsicle supports many SQL 2020 features and um, we are tracking those on, on this GitHub page. It's an open source project um, and you can always get the very latest code on its um, GitHub page. Hipsicle supports a multi backend runtime where a core runtime library interacts with uh, modular runtime backend plugins that then interact with the actual um, backends. And when a kernel is to be executed, the runtime accesses the device code that's stored in the user application and feeds it to the uh, backend for execution. As far as compilation flows are concerned, Hipsicle supports several compilation flows. Um, the most simple one is the pure OpenMP C++ library compilation flow, where Hipsicle acts as an OpenMP C++ library that uh, then allows you to compile SQL code with any OpenMP compiler provided it supports C++17. Then the most well-known compilation flow is the Clang based flow where Hipsicle combines potentially multiple Clang toolchains such as the Clang CUDA toolchain, Clang HIP toolchain or Clang SQL toolchain to generate um, device code for um, various um, backends such as PTX for CUDA, AMD GCN for AMD and so on. Then takes those compiled kernels, puts them all into one binary. And then there's an, a host pass that um, takes care of compiling also for the host. And uh, in order to make those Clang toolchains understand SQL code, there's a Clang plugin that um, teaches it those. But the user does not really have to worry about much of these details because um, the user can just invoke um, the SQL CC and um, depending on which target is specified, um, the SQL CC compilation driver will then automatically uh, select an appropriate compilation flow. Recently, we have also added the NVC++ based flow 
where um, Hipsicle can act as a library for NVIDIA's NVC++ compiler, uh, which can then be used to target the host CPU as well as um, NVIDIA GPUs. Now let's talk a bit about moving beyond OpenCL and how um, we can arrive at a multi backend interpretation of SQL from a HIPSQL perspective. This has now also been um, added to SQL 2020. And if you want to see a SQL 2020 a specification perspective on this, then I recommend you check out the talk using interoperability mode in SQL 2020. HIPSQL really has pioneered SQL beyond OpenCL using its HIP and CUDA backends already in 2018. And the core idea is that if you focus on integrating with the backend that is best supported by hardware vendors, then you get benefits such as improved performance. Um, and um, if your, your SQL application then looks like a CUDA application, for example, to, to the CUDA platform, then you are able to use CUDA debuggers, CUDA profilers. So you can use, you, you can tie into ex existing um, ecosystems maintained by hardware vendors. And that makes SQL independent from direct hardware vendor support. Now I want to call out that it is a myth that SQL support from hardware vendors is needed for stability or perf performance or something else. And I think the notion that this might be required comes from OpenCL where it's generally required or expected that hardware vendors should provide an implementation of OpenCL for, for their hardware in order to run OpenCL code on it. That's not really the case with SQL because everybody can build a SQL compiler front end that takes some SQL code, extracts the kernels, compiles them to some intermediate representation that is understood by whatever the compute platform of the hardware vendor is and which can then be fed into this compute platform. Hipsicle actually goes even one step further because it not only integrates with vendor toolchains, it also integrates with vendor programming models and enables mix and match of programming models inside kernels. For example, if you have um, a kernel, then you can use um, Hipsicle if target to specialize um, code paths for various backends. And inside these branches, you can then use backend specific features or language extensions. For example, inside the host path, we could um, use OpenMP pragmas inside the kernel, or we could call CPU vector intrinsics, or even call regular C++ libraries, or even external libraries as a shared object or something like that. Similarly, inside um, a CUDA branch, we could call some CUDA optimized version, which then might be using some CUDA language extensions. And what this enables is that we can have um, a gradual transition from a CUDA code to SQL code if we have a CUDA code base that we want to port to a SQL code base. And we can then iteratively um, port the kernels from CUDA to SQL um, without having to do it all at once. Or if we have a very optimized section of, of, of um of code that we know is perfectly optimized. We don't really want to touch it anymore. We can just keep it in the original programming model and call it from the SQL kernel. This also enables um, using optimized libraries from hardware vendors and their ecosystems um, inside your kernels. For example, you can call AMD's rock brim library for um, parallel primitives inside your SQL kernels, or you can call NVIDIA's cup library for algorithmic primitives inside your SQL kernels. Of course, in, if you do this uh, and appropriately guard the usage of this functionality with macros to, de de to detect if this is supported, um, then you can still um, have uh, code that is compatible with, with other SQL implementations. Another thing that HipSQL does is this integration with vendor supported compilers and this can make the SQL ecosystem more robust. At the moment we're in the situation where for every SQL backend we can actually write on top of vendor provided compilers. So for the CPU backend we can run with any vendor provided OpenMP compiler. For the HIP backend, we can either use regular um, Clang 
or we can use AMD's Clang that gets distributed as part of uh, the Rock'em stack. We can use um, Intel's DPC++ when targeting um, Intel GPUs. Or we can use um, in NVIDIA's NVC++ compiler when um, targeting CUDA. And what this enables is um, main is day one hardware support. As soon as uh, this support pops up in um, this, the, the compilers and compute stacks of hardware vendors. And also performance and, um, and uh, the vendor hardware expertise from those models enters um, the, the sickle world. An important uh, thing to note here in this context is the concept of library only backends. Um, the sickle implementation, the sickle specification explicitly allows library only backends or library only implementations. And a library only implementation means that we're implementing sickle as a library for some third party compiler. And this is an important pillar to allowing SQL on top of vendor supported compilers. It can also be very important for portability because HipSQL's OpenMP backend runs practically on any CPU. You just need some OpenMP compiler for it that supports C17. The perspective of the SQL 2020 specification is that this is mainly, these library only implementations are mainly intended to run on the host. And originally, they were not primarily designed for performance. Hipsicle is pushing the idea of a library only host backend for performance. And if you work with the OpenMP backend, uh, don't underestimate it. It can deliver competitive performance for many applications. We're also pushing the idea of library only backends for accelerators. Because if we can have library only backends for, for host, why shouldn't we also? Uh, why should we limit ourselves to not also have library-only backends for accelerators? And as it turns out, a compiler really does not need a lot to be able to support SQL. You need to be able to use pure C++ in kernels. So you need to, if you're, if you're running on top of CUDA, you need a way around the CUDA device attributes, for example. And you need some execution model that's reasonably similar to SQL or other um, GPU-centric um, um, models like OpenCL or CUDA um, so that you can map SQL to, to those models. In HipSQL, we have introduced a, a, the ability for our CUDA backend to operate as a library for NVIDIA's NVC++ compiler. And this is the first library-only device backend in a major SQL implementation. And if you want to learn more about it, then I recommend you check out my talk. How much SQL does a compiler need? Experiences from the implementation of SQL as a library for NVC++, where I discuss in detail how it works, why it works, and also performance of this approach. But this raises an important question. Namely, what is SQL even? What does it want to be? Because now there are multiple options opening up. It could either be on the on 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 one end of the extremes, it could be a full-blown compiler and toolchain in itself, which is how it's commonly interpreted. This gives you a bit more control over how things are compiled um, and uh, how kernels are embedded into the application and so on, but also requires more effort to develop, more effort and time for uh, widespread adoption or upstreaming, if you want to upstream to um, LLVM, for example, or it could be at the other end of the extreme, it could be a portability layer for third-party compilers, similarly to, for example, Cocos. This is easy to deploy and develop, but then, of course, to depend on the quality and the features that are exposed by those other models and other compilers. Or it could be something in between, and that's kind of where Hipsicle sits, because Hipsicle has characteristics from both, because we're, we're actively exploring this and experimenting with um, both uh, both aspects here. So what we also need to note about library only implementations is that there's a contradiction in the SQL 2020 specification. On the one hand, it says that library only implementations are explicitly allowed. On the other hand, it also says that there are some features which are not really well implementable for library only implementations. For example, there are 
the SQL 2020 specification introduces custom SQL attributes. Um, and of course you cannot implement um, an additional attribute if you don't have your own compiler, if you're using a third party compiler. Also things like kernel introspection might be more limited. But those are sort of more, um, those are features that many users might not even be using. Um, what might be more noticeable is that there's a problem with the programming models. So the parallel four um, model that um, accepts a range as argument is sufficiently implementable uh, on library only, compiler based implementations, no matter what hardware they target. The parallel four model that accepts an ND range as argument is however notoriously difficult to implement for library only implementations on the host. And that is because it requires um, the implementation to support um, explicit barriers. So the user can put in explicit barriers and that dramatically changes um, how code can be mapped to hardware if you don't have compiler transformations available. Also in SQL 1 to 1 there was the hierarchical parallel 4 model that has been discouraged in, in SQL 2020. And that model is notoriously difficult to implement on GPUs and might even be impossible to implement on GPUs for library only implementations. So we can make a case for a new programming model. And um, clearly we need a model that exposes the functionality of parallel four with ND range arguments such as local memory, uh, group algorithms and all these low level optimizations that you can do. But it should work well for all implementation choices on all the hardware that SQL wants to target. So we also need a model that is flexible enough to adapt to all hardware architectures and we have different levels of parallelism on different backends or hardware. On, on CPU setup, on a host setup, you might have um, multiple NUMA nodes, which might be um, consisting of multiple cores, which might be consisting of multiple SIMD units and so on. While the, the, the hierarchy of execution units on a GPU, for example, might look differently. Also, if we look at something like CUDA and cooperative groups, I think it's clear that we need to work towards having more flexible group hierarchies than we currently have in, in SQL with work groups and uh, subgroups as the only um, uh, types of groups. So backends need to be able to expose hardware specific hierarchies of parallelism. And this is where the scope parallelism model comes in, which uh, we have developed in HipSQL and available um, as an extension. Scope parallelism um, works by invoking a parallel function and then you give it the number of groups and um, the logical work group size. And then you get a group into your um, kernel lambda, but that group might be of backend specific type because this allows the implementation to provide arbitrary group types that might be optimized for the backend and it can also encode certain optimization hints as template parameters into the type of the group. Then you can nest um, these distribute groups calls arbitrarily deep. And whenever you call distribute groups, it basically tells the SQL implementation that you want to go into the, to the next level of parallelism to split the group into its subunits, so to speak. Of course, at some point, the SQL implementation will say, uh, I cannot split this any further and will just give you a scalar group. That's trivial. But when exactly this happens then depends on the backend. Then you can also have a distribute items call, which then um, makes sure that the code is executed for each um, logical item that you have requested in your logical group size. Here's a more complex example. That's a, um, a work group reduction. Um, of course, in practice, you would just call SQL 2020 group algorithm to do this, but this is just an illustration of how things can look with scope parallelism. So you can also request with scope parallelism static allocations of local memory. You can also just use local accessors. Um, and then you can um, have a distribute items call to initialize that um, local memory. You can have explicit calls to um, group algorithms and barriers. 
uh, you can have um, also a distribute items in wait call, which is similar to, to a distribute items followed by a, by a barrier. And then in the end, you can uh, request the SQL implementation to only execute code for a single item uh, in order to write back results, for example. Okay, that's all, all great, but now you all are probably saying, yeah, but I already have all this code in uh, written in ND range parallel four. So what, what can we do then? If you already have your code in D-Range Parallel 4, you cannot port it to, say, scope parallelism. How can we then get performance on CPUs without relying on OpenCL? Let's first look at how other SQL implementations have solved performance on CPU. And the short answer is that the problem has always been offloaded to OpenCL. So traditionally, a SQL compiler would compile to something like um, a SPIRV or some other intermediate representation. This is then handled by OpenCL. The OpenCL CPU implementation then does some compiler transformations that make the um, SQL execution model run efficiently on a CPU, and then you get the machine code out of this process. Um, of course, in this case, you need an OpenCL CPU implementation, and this can be a portability issue because there are actually very few CPU vendors that provide an OpenCL implementation. And it also makes your applications more difficult deploy, to deploy because you have this additional OpenCL dependency just to run on the CPU. Also, it locks you into using an OpenCL runtime. What if you want to use uh, TBB or OpenMP or some other CPU um, runtime instead? So we came up with the idea of pulling those compiler transformations that, are, that typically happen inside OpenCL CPU implementations directly into the SQL compiler. So the SQL compiler takes the SQL code and when compiling for the host code, it applies compiler transformations um, in the host pass that make it run efficiently on CPU. And we do this by leveraging our existing um, HIPSQL Clang plugin and we add some additional um, LLVM IR transformations that happen during the host pass. This is totally independent from OpenCL. It works wherever LLVM works. And it can also work with any uh, C++ CPU runtime because it just looks for specific attributes that uh, mark the functions that uh, need to be considered as kernel entry pools and then it, it optimizes those. So this effectively retains many advantages of library only implementations. And uh, here you can see what's new. Basically, we now have also the Clang plugin working in the Clang host pass to um, perform these IR transformations that uh, make things more efficient. And this can lead to substantial performance increases in um, the uh, uh, CPU backend if you're using this functionality. If you want to learn more, more about this, then I recommend you check out the poster Exploring Compiler Aided and Derange Parallel 4 Implementations on CPU in Hipsicle by uh, Joachim. Um, who worked on this for his master thesis and there you can find all the details of uh, about how it works and the performance numbers and so on. So we have tested this on multiple um, CPU architectures. It works um, on uh, at least on AMD, Intel, as well as two ARM architectures. It delivers competitive performance compared to the Pockel OpenCL implementation on CPU. You can get it with any HIPSQL um, starting with version 0.9.2. And this really allows SQL kernels to run efficiently on any CPU, any CPU, as long as it's supported by LLVM. Now let's look at the runtime. And here too, we can learn something from stepping back from the traditional OpenCL style heritage. Traditionally, um, in, in SQL, a queue is mapped to one backend queue. Hipsicle doesn't do this. Hipsicle decouples SQL queues from backend objects. So the user constructs a number of SQL queues. The work from those SQL queues all gets fed into the same scheduler um, in the Hipsicle core runtime. And the backends then maintain queue pools if they are based on queues. And the scheduler then automatically distributes work from all queues across the backend resources. So what does this mean? 
It means that the performance and the concurrency of the operations is independent from the number of uh, user queues. So you get consistent performance no matter if you use one sickle queue and submit all your work to that or if you use three sickle queues and um, submit your work to this. And I think since sickle is a high level model, why should we have to jump through the same hoops as in, as in, as in CUDA, for example, where you need to have um, one stream per operation that you want to run uh, concurrently. So if you want to have a, a kernel and a memory copy to run concurrently, you would need to construct two CUDA streams. Why would we need the same in SQL if we're already working with task graphs in a high-level model? Additionally, in, in this design, the scheduler can make stronger assumptions about the execution behavior because it can tie the number of because the implementation can tie the number of backend queues that are constructed to the hardware capabilities. So if we know that, for example, the hardware can uh, always execute two memory copies simultaneously, we can construct two backend queues for memory copies, for example. If you want to see this uh, in action, how Hipsicl extracts concurrency, then I recommend you, you check out the um, poster empirical measures of SQL concurrency, where my collaborators and I um, have looked at that. Now, what is a queue even? In Hipsicle, a queue is nothing but a lightweight object that does not represent any actual backend execution resources. Instead, it's really more of a mechanism to just append work to the global SQL task graph and also synchronize groups of tasks, namely those tasks that, that have been submitted to um, the same SQL queue, using one weight call. So a better name actually might be something like a task collection. And uh, this has substantial consequences because as it turns out, then a queue does not have to be tied to one device. And what you can do with Hipsicle, so you can construct a queue, let's construct an in-order queue and tie it to some device. And if we submit a kernel, it will run on, on that some device. But now we can also add a property that tells Hipsicle to execute a particular kernel on another device. And that works. And that's convenient if, if, for example, most of the operations on a queue should go to a specific device with some exceptions and you still want um, them all to synchronize with the same uh, weight call. And you really can then have uh, this one weight call that synchronizes operations that are actually distributed across multiple devices. And you can even have an in-order queue that can enforce in-order behavior across multiple devices if you have uh, multiple kernels running on those. You can even go one step further. In Hipsicle, we even support multi-device queues, which allows Hipsicle to distribute a task graph automatically across the entire system. And you can do this in a very straightforward way. When you construct a queue, you can, um, as a device selector, you can give Hipsicle the uh, system, the new system selector V, which tells Hipsicle that um, it can distribute the work from this queue to the, to the, to the entire system. Alternatively, you could also explicitly specify a list of devices to schedule to. This already works, but please don't expect good performance yet from the scheduler because it's still a um, work in progress. But the important point is that this is really just a generalization of the idea that we can extract concurrency from a single device by maintaining a backend queue pool. Um, it's really just the same idea applied to the entire system. There's also another remark um, that I'd like to make. Um, if we interpret a SQL queue as just a task collection, it's also fairly apparent to me that if we're talking about SQL graphs in analogy to something like CUDA graphs um, or other graph-based APIs, we could do this with minimal additions to the queue interface. We would basically just need a um, queue replay function. Similarly, a SQL context is also decoupled from any backend contexts. This has practical advantages because a, um, it prevents performance bugs. The default constructor of the SQL queue um, constructs a new context. And if that constructs a new OpenCL context or CUDA context, that can be very expensive. Plus, it's very unclear what a context should even be in SQL. It was very clear when SQL was um, built on top of OpenCL, then clearly a SQL context would wrap an OpenCL context. But now we don't have that. Um, that uh, being tied to OpenCL anymore. 
and it's totally unclear what, for example, an OpenMP context should be. So therefore, in Hipsicle, we say that this kind of thing should be managed internally by backends that need it. Similarly, subbuffers are a concept that came from OpenCL, which is not really needed. Um, so in, in originally, this was needed to allow the runtime to execute concurrently kernels that use the same data. Because if you just have accessors that access disjoint access ranges, you can give them an access offset and access range. Even if they are disjoint, um, the kernels will synchronize with, with each other. You have to use different subbuffers. In Hipsicle, however, it's sufficient to just have disjoint accessor ranges in order to get um, uh, kernels to execute um, uh, concurrently. And this is possible because Hipsicle tracks buffer data state below the granularity of a buffer. And that is a fundamental difference in how uh, buffer support in the Hipsicle runtime is designed. Uh, if you want to use this functionality, you can use this with what we call pages, which are so-called, um, which are inspired by virtual memory pages, but are unrelated to those. It's basically a, a Hipsicle buffer page is the, um, the unit at which the SQL runtime tracks data state. And we can tell the buffer that it should have a certain page size. And then if we submit kernels and they have access ranges um, where they access different pages, then they can uh, run concurrently. And here we only have a single page. Here we um, access multiple pages, but the access offset is chosen such that there is no intersection between those um, page ranges. So those two kernels could uh, run concurrently, even though they use the same buffer and are both read write. So in conclusion, I think it's important to rethink SQL independently of its history as OpenCL abstraction layer. And I think this is the one big thing that, that uh, I'd like you to take away from this. And from its inception, Hipsicle has always been about exploring new ways of designing SQL implementations using non-OpenCL backends, writing on top of vendor-supported compilers, um, with device library-only backends, and the idea of aggregating multiple tool chains, with new programming models like scope parallelism, CPU acceleration of kernels without OpenCL, by decoupling backend objects from SQL objects, as we have seen in, in, in Q, uh, leading up to things like multi-device queues. And there's more than that. There are more features that I cannot go into detail here. So there are things like asynchronous buffers, which are buffers that do not block in, um, in their destructor, and also factory functions for buffers to make their intent clearer. There are lightweight accessors called raw accessor that can um, reduce register pressure in some cases. And then there's also buffer use M interoperability. And this comes from the fact that in Hipsicle, every buffer is always built uh, on top of a USM pointer. So you can always turn a buffer and turn, take a buffer and turn it into a USM pointer or vice versa, put a buffer on top of a USM pointer. Plus Hipsicle supports, of course, many standard SQL 2020 features on a wide range of supported hardware. And we even support some one API components like one MKL. If you want to learn about that, then I recommend you check out um, our paper exploring the possibility of a Hipsicle based implementation of one API. And there's more to come. So we're currently looking into um, working on a single compilation pass for host and all targeted devices. So the code only needs to be passed once to speed up compilation times, integrated profiling functionality for SQL task graphs and so on and so forth. So if you're interested in, in anything that I have talked about, then all features uh, are available on GitHub. Um, go and check them out and uh, have fun uh, with the other iWalker content. Thank you.